and uh, our job is to talk about uh, the impact of place on Appalachian writing and writers. Well, duh. Uh, so, you know, I, I kind of think some of the other ones were easier, but, you know, we'll, we'll go with it, okay? Um, so I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that I think that maybe place is very important uh, uh, in uh, Appalachian uh, writing. We do, after all, name it that way, Appalachian literature. Uh, some uh, groups of uh, writers, some bodies of literature are named by the period, like medieval literature, or by some school of thought, uh, the transcendentalists, but uh, we don't do that. We talk about Appalachian literature, so we, are, we name it and name what we do uh, by the name of the place that we are writing about or that we have some connection to. Other places do that too, of course, and we talk about Southern literature and the literature of New England. And, and so I'm wondering for one thing, if, uh, if place in Appalachian literature functions in some different ways than place does in other literatures that are also named after the region they are from. Uh, as the moderator, I don't feel compelled to answer that question. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but I thought I'd throw that out there. Um, I suspect, too, that there are a lot of different ways, uh, maybe as many as writers in this room, which would be a lot, a lot of different ways in which writers use place in Appalachian writing, uh, and a lot of reasons why we do that. So I thought we might begin by talking about that, like, well, why, what is it about Appalachia that seems to, uh, to cause so many writers and so much activity around writing. And you know, we really have uh, an amazing number of writers, uh, readings, uh, Appalachian publishers, Appalachian uh, symposia. And so uh, this suggests, and, I, and one of my theories about life is that anything that is really noticeable like that has several causes, uh, several reasons for being. So, uh, so maybe we could be, begin with that question then, what is it about the region? And, and I think it might be different for all of us. Um, for me, it has to do with, uh, for one thing, uh, personal and, and family history. Uh, I write a great deal or have written a great deal in, in somewhat different forms about this one little uh, part of the world that is uh, really just a part of one creek uh, in northern Clay County uh, in southeastern Kentucky, uh, which is where my family has lived in that place for about 200 years. I was a child, I was a child there, so my childhood memories are of that place. And I've lived there now for 25 years. And so the sights and smells and the voices and stories, the whole history of that place are, you know, are really what is in me to write. Uh, and so to me, although there are other reasons I think why uh, write about Appalachian, consider myself an Appalachian writer. That's, uh, that's definitely one of them. Do you all feel that way? Or do you, were there different things about the region that drew you to write about it? Um, well, you mentioned the, uh, the sights and the smells, and I, I think that where we start as writers is often from our senses. So if <laughs> the place is our place, and it's in our senses, <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought I'd said something really profound for a minute, but it was just Frank. 
so much for that. Right? Hi, Frank. <laughs> um, but uh, I think that uh, so much of our writing does initially come from our senses that, you know, the place that we start out, the place that we feel closest to, our writing is going to come from that. I also think that um, Appalachians are people who are storytellers. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you grow up with these stories uh, and you hear them in, you know, maybe your parents' voices, maybe your grandparents' uh, voices, uh, then those stories are, are, are going to wake up something in you. Uh, and that's going to be the voice that you feel closest to as, a, uh, as you write. Um, I know the previous panel was on, uh, was on dialect uh, at Appalachian, you know, Appalachian speech and writing. Uh, and um, I know that when I write you know, my Appalachian fiction, I'm not talking the way I talk when I teach my English classes. I'm talking in my head in the voice you know, of, of my grandparents uh, and the people, that I, the people that I grew up around. So you know, the voice of the place uh, I think is also, uh, or the voices, I should say, because there, there are different voices in Appalachia, there's not just one. Um, those live on in you and, uh, and, and influence you as a writer, I think. I mean, for me, well, two things. Um, I think one, it's, it's important when you're talking about place that you talk about particular places. Um, for me, that you, when, you, when, you're, when you're writing, about place, you're, you're, when you're evoking particular places, then that's, that's what makes people sort of inhabit those places. But, I mean, I'm not from Appalachia. Um, but the, the, the thing that, the reason I, <laughs> I write about it is because Appalachia is one of these places that, I was up in the Green Mountains a couple years ago teaching a, uh, a workshop on writing about place, and they just said, you know, teach whatever you want. So I said, well, we'll, we'll write about um, imperiled places. Um, how do you write about an imperiled place? And so I'm teaching this workshop, and like in, in the second day, I realized that these, these students, they're all from New England, and they have no idea what I'm talking about. And it dawned on me that they don't think of the Green Mountains as something imperiled. They don't think of it as something that can be taken away or something that can be destroyed. So I realized that my relationship to the landscapes I write about are all relationships to, to landscapes that can be destroyed. Um, and so that's, that's what compels me, um, that's what compelled me to write Lost Mountain, that's what compelled me to write a book about Robinson Forest. Um, the University of Kentucky owns Robinson Forest there's about a hundred million dollars worth of coal beneath it, and it can be destroyed tomorrow. So um, that's that's where my writing about place comes from. It it, um, it, it comes from that that sense of the. Um, I mean, it's a heartbreaking <laughs> sense of something that that can really be taken away. Oh, Frank, welcome. Um, we, uh, I don't know if you heard the actual question. <laughs> We're talking about what is it about Appalachia that compels us as writers to, to use that in some way in our writing? Well, I think for me, it's, it's a definition of Appalachia that I, that I inherited, that I think is incomplete, that leaves out people of color. You know, in the early 90s, the dictionary actually said that Appalachia was uh, the mountainous regions. Of, no, Appalachians were uh, people from the mountainous regions of Appalachia. But they also said specifically that they were white. Um, and, but I also knew that, I mean, geographically, even with the, the government definition uh, and those traditional boundaries of the region, that it still included Bur uh, Birmingham and Pittsburgh. And having lived in and worked in both of those spaces, I knew that there were other people there who were not white. And so for me, I've place is not separated from people. And the idea of trying to people that place with people of color is, is really, I think, the mission of, of the journal Pluck. It's been the mission of uh, 
I guess most of my work in the region is to prove and to document and to chase down and, and help you know, reintroduce this idea that the region is actually more diverse um, than its reputation. You know, I think the, the damage of the negative caricatures from certain movies and certain TV shows uh, that present this caricature of the region that people buy lock, stock, and barrel uh, is already damaging, but to paint that picture and then render whole populations of people invisible, I think, is even more dangerous. And so for me, it's about uh, making the invisible visible and to unmute those muted voices who are assumed to not be included in not just the present, but even the, the history of the region. Um, you know, I think that you know, everybody in this room, if they claim Appalachia, they also claim Nina Simone and Carter G. Woodson uh, and August Wilson and Jesse Owens and Bill Withers. And I mean, those are icons in African-American communities, but they, I don't think they should be looked at detached from this region. So for me, that's what place means, trying to people it uh, and present a, a more honest portrait of the region. So really, four kind of different motivations or compulsions uh, for writing about Appalachia, and I think I think there are um, I think there are many more. James Still uh, said, I can't remember the exact words, but he said something like. Um, God, in the mountains, God raised uh, the earth up so we could see it better. And, um, and, and I think that other things in Appalachia are heightened also. Uh, all of these different currents of, of American history uh, are passed through Appalachia, of course, as they as they do other places, but they're kind of raised up where we can see them uh, better, where we see them really clearly in Appalachia. And I think that all compels us as writers. I'm thinking about things like the, uh, the really dramatic, uh, protracted, violent labor struggles in the coal fields that were, were really a dramatization of, of the whole conflict between the idea of of a democracy uh, of the people and, and of a capitalist society and how that got worked out uh, the way that it did, particularly in West Virginia and, and Eastern Kentucky. And things like, um, well, the whole universal story of uh, an agrarian, a traditional way of life, the way people lived on the planet for thousands of years, giving way to what we call modernization, fairly recent development in human history, and, and how we can still see that in Appalachia and how that embodies that transition also and all of the conflicts and, and losses of that. So I think there are a, a lot of different things that draw us to Appalachia. I feel like and even in just writing about this really small country place, uh, and that if, if I keep doing that even for a long time, I would have just started to suggest some of the complexity and richness of that place. Okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, anybody else want to say anything about that? Or I've got a couple of other ideas we could throw in. <laughs> well, I'll, uh, I'll mention uh, something too uh, to kind of piggyback on some of what, uh, what Frank was saying. I think one of, um, one of the reasons that I write Appalachian fiction too uh, is also uh, to show uh, the lives of some Appalachians that have been historically hidden uh, since uh, my fiction uh, tends to deal with the LGBT community uh, in Appalachia, um, which, you know, 
has always been there, <laughs> uh, but often, uh, you know, but, but often, uh, very often the margins, often, you know, there were the two old school teacher ladies who'd always lived together and wasn't that sweet because, you know, no man ever looked at them, but they at least had each other to take care of, you know, and there's, you know, the guy who has never married but takes really good care of his mama. <laughs> you know, and uh, so you have these sort of stereotypes or archetypes um, uh, of the, the small town Appalachian uh, lesbian and gay people, uh, and uh, that's something that I wanted to expand on, uh, you know, uh, to show that there, there's more than that, uh, and also, uh, you know, just to, in, to increase visibility, um, I think that... Um, I think actually in the previous panel, Crystal was saying something about the uh, the queer motto, uh, you know, we're here, we're queer, get used to it. Uh, there's also the saying, we are everywhere. And I think that, that, is, uh, that that's something that uh, isn't always recognized. I know when I was uh, much younger and, and uh, kind of figuring things out, you know, I thought all gay people were in New York and San Francisco. It was like, you know, you were deported to that area <laughs> if, if you were gay. Uh, and, uh, you know, to, to discover that was not the case uh, was, uh, was a relief to me. <laughs> so, um, uh, uh, so I think for, for me, too, there is um, uh, that drive to, uh, to represent the, uh, the underrepresented uh, in, in Appalachian culture. Oh, and that, that's another, like, national debate, the whole conflict between uh, religious fundamentalists and, and issues of same-sex marriage is, of course, being played out just up the road uh, in eastern Kentucky. So we seem to uh, uh, be sort of magnets for uh, all kinds of controversy. I had, uh, on the way here today, of course, passing from uh, Clay County into Madison County, you go through Jackson County, where a lot of my family's from, um, live there many, there many, many times. I've never seen a Confederate flag there before. And now they're popping up like goldenrod, you know, they're everywhere. So, uh, uh, so some, you know, there is some special relationship, I think, between uh, Appalachia and the and the country in that way seem to embody, you know, the, all of issues of incest get projected onto us. I suspect other people haven't. Uh, but, you know, in the, if you just watch TV, you would just think that incest is just like a hillbilly thing, right? And so uh, all, all these things, maybe both positive and negative, get put into Appalachia, which makes it really rich, uh, really rich for writing about. I'm wondering uh, how you all feel about this too. I, you know, when you kind of sign on for whatever reason uh, as an Appalachian writer, uh, they give you immediately, you may not remember this, but you're, you're given like this whole uh, coal train <laughs> full of stereotypes and expectations uh, and images that you have, that you have somehow inherited, because if you put yourself uh, in this in a tradition of Appalachian writing, writing about Appalachia, all that is there. And so I'm just interested in how other people think about that or deal with that. situation that I've been in uh, as someone, you know, getting, I think it's always interesting as Appalachian writers, the response you get to your work in the world outside Appalachia, you know, uh, when you read reviews and, and so forth. One thing I've encountered, and I'm curious if any of you have as, as well, is to be accused of stereotyping, uh, you know, because, you know, my characters talk a certain way, because they talk like they live in a holler which is, guess what, they live in a holler, that's kind of why. Um, <laughs> and, um, uh, and, and so, you know, to be someone writing from the inside, um, you know, uh, but being accused of perpetuating these kind of stereotypes, like Frank was talking about, stereotypes that you see on TV, uh, I think is a really uneasy, uneasy relationship, and I wonder if the expectation is that 
you know, you write about Appalachia without any local color, without any distinctive voice, as though, you know, it was, you know, a sort of a generic place rather than a place with its own language and culture. Uh, you all like feel limited or challenged anyway by the by all of the stereotypes and images about the region. Well, I don't know that I, I feel limited. I know that I'm I'm often uh, I often feel like I'm pushing up against other people's perceptions of the region that are very limited. Uh, for instance, the notion that there's original rap coming out of Appalachia uh, shocks some people. You know, and I know that given this audience, there are a lot of young people who own some, um, and I've heard it referred to as rap um, <laughs> But, but I, th I think the thing is, is that it's hard for other people to imagine urban spaces in Appalachia. And I think sometimes it's just a, a urban-rural dynamic that people can't accept. Uh, that, you know, it's, it's un unfortunate. And I know that a lot of, a lot of our literature does talk about that and cover it, but I think there's just this extra dynamic that comes with being from the region and being part of the region that happens in contrast to people's expectations and perceptions of the region that they almost refuse to let go of. You know, I think that if you watch late night talk shows, I think Appalachia is probably the only place in America you can still make fun of. And it's okay in the national spectrum. Uh, and you hear hillbilly jokes all the time and in, in every phase of, of, of modern media. Um, and it's, it's interesting, you know, how much effort has been put into that. You know, I just wonder if there's not a, a room somewhere with, you know, a, a thousand people connected computers, you know, that's their daily job is to, you know, <laughs> maintain this idea of what this stereotype is. Yeah. Uh, because it's so pervasive and it, it's, and it's laughable, but it, but I have been in Washington State, the northwest part of our, our wondrous country, and had people at a college campus ask me if there were other black people in Kentucky. And I said, other than me, you know. <laughs> as if I was a test tube baby, you know. <laughs> and so always, you know, I just, I start counting, you know, while I'm answering the question. I'm like, well, mom and dad. And, you know, <laughs> Because it's, it's ludicrous to me that, but at the same time, I'm trying to appreciate the power of, of stereotypes and, and for us, of caricatures, because the caricatures are stronger than the stereotypes. I mean, you still get those glances at family reunions from the cousins from Detroit who are checking to see if you have shoes on and if you have all your teeth and, uh, you know, have you kissed your sister? And I mean, these things are so old, but how can they say this current, uh, in spite of what we're producing? And I think that everything we write, uh, in some way, you know, fights to, to, to form a, a new, modern uh, you know, perception of, of, of what reality is uh, for us and for other people. But they just won't let go. And I don't, I don't know what to do about that. I think, too, there's so much of an emphasis on the symptoms and not the causes. I just met Denise Giardina backstage. And uh, there's a scene in her novel, Storming Heaven, um, where some reporters from New York come down. Um, and one of the reporters says to one of the characters, this is a really screwed up place. And she says, how do you think it got that way? Yeah. And he says, I don't know. And so, you know, if you think back to that Diane Sawyer thing that she did about five years ago, I mean, that, that thing perpetuated every stereotype um, you know, it was nonfiction, the Mountain Dew mouth, you know, all down the line. And, but she, Denise, uh, um, Diane Sawyer, I mean, she's from Kentucky, she should have known better, but she, she had no interest in the causes of what she was seeing. She was simply interested in the symptoms of what she was seeing. And I talked to Ron Eller later about it, and, and he said that when the first thing she said to him when she sat down to interview him, she said, I don't want to talk about mountaintop removal. So, I mean, there, there, there's simply no, there's no interest in the political and social and economic, you know, causes that underlie the symptoms of the stereotypes. And I guess that 
I do feel limited in some way by the existence of those because although I think that the best response to them as a writer is just to write as well as I can, is to portray something of the, of, of the rich and, and complex social structure of the place and something of the deep humanity of the people there. That's, uh, so that's, uh, writing well is, is a response to that and that is, is of course a challenge. But I also feel like sometimes I'm so much put on the defensive that, uh, that I can't um, make a full picture. Uh, so in some pieces there are gonna be things I'm gonna leave out and, and I don't feel good about that. But for example, uh, a few months ago, uh, a, a survey uh, was reported in the New York Times, kind of a statistical su study, announcing that Clay County, where I live, is, quote, the hardest place to live in the United States. All right, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> go Tigers. So, um, and so, then, you know, that puts, so then I, I wrote something in response to that, uh, which was trying to uh, talk about the reasons why people, many of us who live there, love this place, why we want actually want to live there. So I sent this to the New York Times, uh, and they said that it was really good, but that they didn't publish things that were critical of the New York Times. <laughs> So I had to find more local venues for that one. Uh, but see, um, and, and a friend, and, and I talked a lot about this because he was saying, you know, I agree with you about the whole stereotypes thing, but it's causing us not to really talk, be talking as much as we should be about people who really are poor, people who really do have such a hard life. You know, so in that way, although I try when I'm writing most of the time, you know, not to think about stereotypes, but just to do, you know, the best that I can to portray things as fully as I can. But, but, in, but sometimes I do feel hemmed in by that because, you know, because the, the, our response to the stereotypes, both, romantic, both the romantic ones and the really vicious ones. And, and I think you're right that it seems like these things, and maybe it's like racism in this way, just don't give way to mere fact or reality because they're about something else. You know, they're, they're not rational. There's a lull. <laughs> yeah, we can all, we, let's just all think about that for a minute, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Meditate on it silently. Yes. It would be great if, like, this would be, I don't think this is going to happen, but if this would be, like, the last Appalachian Symposium where we ever had to talk about stereotypes, you know, mm -hmm. where we could just actually go ahead and talk about mm -hmm. uh, the realities and, and deal with that, but it's probably not going to happen anytime soon. Mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, younger writers, maybe, like your, your generation, well, you're all kind of a different generation from me, but uh, that, you know, I wonder if it's different in, in some way, because I still have a lot of that, all these old things in my head. Do you feel like that? Do you feel hemmed in by stereotypes at all? Yeah, I, I feel that writing about the region has gotten very different. Um, I recently uh, revisited one of my uh, one of my novels that I wrote in. It came out in 2002, so not very not terribly long ago in the grand scheme of things. Um, but I'm actually working uh, with a friend on adapting it into a play, uh, and so you know I was looking at it and I was thinking, life. And this is a young adult novel. Life for Appalachian teenagers has changed so radically since 2002. I mean, think about it. Um, you know, these kids uh, that I was writing about at the time, they didn't have cell phones. 
There were phones, but no poor kids in Appalachia were going to have a phone. Uh, they didn't have, you know, reliable uh, internet access. They didn't have, um, and since I'm talking about uh, uh, lesbian and gay kids, they didn't really have as many depictions of themselves uh, that they could see, you know, that they could see on TV. Um, I think um, globalization uh, has um, had a huge impact, uh, you know, on, on all culture, but on Appalachian culture uh, in particular. And so maybe some of those stereotypes, um, you know, are lessened uh, because there's more access to the larger world. And I think that has good points and bad points too, um, because you know you do get into the danger of everybody getting so homogeneous that they all, you know, that, that, that they all talk alike and, and uh, you know, all like whatever uh, whatever the big commercial product is, rather than looking to their their local communities. Um, but at the same time, there is less isolation. Uh, and so I think that um, a as I revisited this novel, I was like, okay, if I'm not going to make this a historical novel, these kids got to have a phone. <laughs> you know that they've got to they've got to have uh, more access to the outside world than I uh, than I originally imagined. And, and in some ways, I also think the region is more relevant when you think about, say, a series like Justified, yeah. and this audience. And I mean, John Grisham's novel, uh, set in a region that actually talked about. Uh, you know, environmental injustices in a, in a real way, mm -hmm. and you know he has the has millions of followers and readers. Mm -hmm. So just having the the topic in that space, in new spaces like that, I think uh, legitimizes the region in a way that before people considered it didn't exist or was invisible. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm always looking for the silver lining and 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 for that presence and anything that says uh, they you know. Not that just we're here, we're everywhere, but they know we're here and they were everywhere. We're and there's evidence of it uh, you know, in, in every space. And in spaces like that, uh, especially mass media, uh, you know, however many caricatures it puts forth, uh, at least it gives us a space and something to criticize and push back against. Um, I think that uh, the blurb under our uh, topic, said something about how do Appalachian writers both honor the place and at the same time uh, tackle issues uh, like environmental injustice. And, and it seems to me that Lost Mountain, Eric does both of those things. Could you talk a little about that? I think when I started writing Lost Mountain, I thought it was a book about a mountain, <laughs> naively. And then I realized it was a book about all the people that lived around the mountain. And so, you know, it's, I, you just realize you can't write about the place without writing about the people. And you can't write about the people without writing about the place. It, there's, it, it's, it's, it's so interconnected in a way that I think a lot of other literature isn't. Um, Verna Mae Sloan said in What My Heart Wants to Tell, she said the mountains are comforting and prisoning. Mm -hmm. I like that, that, I like that, 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 that dichotomy. Um, but I, you know, when I started writing Lost Mountain, Gurney Norman sat me down and said, you know, these are like 15 things you can't do when you write about people in Appalachia, <laughs> you know? And uh, it was real important for me you know, when I interviewed like Patsy Carter, whose daughter was killed by an overloaded coal truck, I mean, it was just real important for me to be just just a conduit of her story, just to sort of try to get out of the way and let her let her you know tell the story through me. Um, I mean, I just wanted to be as as true to her experience um, as I possibly could, and as 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 empathetic as I as I could. Um, and I just, I realized that I started, I would, I would make two trips a month. One trip I would go to the mountain and then another trip I would go just talk to people, you know, who lived there and their, you know, their foundations were crumbling and their water was bad. Um, and it just, I, 
began to sense just the, you know, as, as the K KFTC t-shirt says, you know, if, if the land is sick, the people are sick. Um, and I, you know, I just began to see what a, what a inter intertwining there was between the story of the land and the story of the people. Yeah, I'm not sure I see that as a, as a dichotomy, really. How do you both honor the place and also address uh, the, the problems that are clearly there uh, in terms of poverty and environmental injustice? Uh, but to do that is a way, seems to me, is a way of honoring the place. And even though I said sometimes I feel like I'm on the defensive, so I can't, uh, so I tend to emphasize one thing more than the other. But to, uh, but to address those injustices is a way of honoring Appalachia and what, what we do see as a value there and, and what we love about that. I think you love a place like you like you love your family. You know your family's not perfect. <laughs> you know uh, you could list uh, you could list faults uh, for you know your aunts and uncles or your mom and your daddy, uh, but they're yours and you love them. And you don't like to hear other people say bad things about them, right? Because they don't have the right. That's the you know that's my mama. You, you shut up. Uh, and so I think it's it's a similar thing with the with the place. It's like you know. We live here, we love it, um, but we see the things that are problems, we see the things that need to be made better. Uh, and because they need to be made better and we love the place, we stay too. I mean, and I think that's always a question um, with Appalachian writers, you know, um, is that, that, oh, you wanna be a writer, so you know, where are you gonna go to be a writer? You know, you're going to go to some big city, right? Uh, and uh, no, uh, if you're, you know, I think if uh, if you're an Appalachian writer, you know, you want to stay, you know, close to where your stories are, close to where the heart of your stories uh, lie. Uh, and so, you know, that's another question, I, I, I guess, that, that comes up is, you know, the question of you know, do you stay uh, in this place even though you see environmental injustice, you know, racial injustice, homophobia, um, you know, uh, is, is the answer fleeing or is the answer staying and, you know, writing uh, the truth the best you can see it, in my case, the truth through fiction, <laughs> but, uh, you know, to, to really commit uh, to, to making things better. And and of course the issues keep changing, don't they, as, as you suggested, uh, so that there's always, you know, we're in, the, in a way, I think this is another thing compelling about the region and it makes it so rich to write about is that the juxtaposition always of the past and, and the present, uh, but the present just keeps coming and so issues that writers are dealing with now, I mean, like you said, you had to go back and put cell phones in because right. contrary to popular belief, we're pretty well wired, you know, in most, uh, most places in the mountains. And, and then what seems to be happening now in areas, uh, particularly around where I live in southeastern Kentucky, is just a really dramatic depopulation. Uh, schools are, public schools are closing, uh, post offices are closing, stores are closing, and the more that happens, as more people move away, then it's like, you know, it's water going down the drain, it picks up as it goes along because there's less reason to stay and it's, it's becoming more, you know, more and more difficult in some ways uh, because there are just fewer things going on. So I think that's another you know, another whole area that uh, we could be writing about. Well, and I think going back to what Eric was saying, that that's a symptom too, you know, and, and uh, it's, it's important to look at, you know, what is the cause of the symptom of this drain uh, of people leaving the region, or what are the causes, as you would say. I mean, it's certainly not just, a, uh, not just one thing. 
Um, you know, but uh, but certainly I would say the the lack of the the lack of economic opportunity uh, for a lot of people is certainly uh, certainly a big one. Well, the coal industry has done everything it possibly can to make sure there's not a post coal economy, yep. and now we're we're at the end of a coal economy, and what are we going to do? And even that that depopulation or or flight, uh, those people are going somewhere, and one of the things that I see happening is it makes the the region a little more fluid. Uh, we, you know, we don't talk about Atlanta being one county from Appalachia or Cincinnati being, you know, one county away from Appalachia. But both of those communities have large pockets of Appalachian peoples right. and culture and activity. Uh, you know, and you usually go where you have somebody already. Um, so that you know, that's that's the silver lining again. You know, we've been that people have been forced to make those moves, but what happens when they land? Uh, you know, how do they maintain that family connection, uh, mm -hmm. that the cultural imperatives, the value system, mm -hmm. the things I think that make uh, people from the region resilient and, and, and creative and survivalist, uh, the same things that we stay here for, that you know, the same reason we call it home. That's a good place to end on home. Thank you. Thank you all very much. <laughs>